So hello. This is Thomas Hillen Eriksson speaking to you from Gladstone, Queensland. I just showed you a few glimpses from the harbour of Gladstone and the central business district and I'm now walking now walking onto a footpath to get away from the wind because this is a windy day. Now where am I? I'm in the Spinnaker Park. Lush and beautiful parkland developed by the Ports uh, Corporation a few years ago. It's really just a tongue of land sticking out, separating the marina from the um, harbour proper. And it's been developed in a really pleasant way with lots of native plants, with a little pond. I'm actually heading towards that pond now. And with a number of picnic facilities and a cafe. As a matter of fact, there's a children's birthday party with balloons and sausage sizzle and soft drinks and lots of fun going on just a few hundred meters down the footpath um, as I speak. But what I'm talking to you about today, or rather what I intend to be talking about today, is not the Spinnaker Park or the pleasures of sausage sizzles, but uh, of the controversies around the dredging of Gladstone Harbour. And that's why I thought it appropriate to be located near the harbour. Although I'm going away for it, from it because it's such a windy day, so that would destroy the quality of the sound on this recording. So here we are. Um, now, every, uh, not every, but many deep sea ports have to be dredged now and then. Silt and various forms of matter have to be removed from the seafloor in order to uh, keep it deep enough. Because of the natural movement of water, um, the seafloor changes and uh, sandbanks and mud banks uh, develop and so on. As a matter of fact, for many years there's been a site a few miles off the coast towards the Great Barrier Reef where uh, dredge spoil has traditionally been deposited. Now the dredging that took place between 2010 and 2012 is of a different kind because it was of a much, much larger scale. In order to allow very large ships to um, uh, get into the narrow straits separating Curtis Island from the mainland and to um, um, load with uh, uh, liquid natural gas. Sorry about that. Um, they had to uh, dig a deeper channel. So um, 23 million cubic meters of material, dredged material, was removed from the seafloor. Not dumped largely into this uh, area in the Great Barrier Reef National Park, but um, within the band wall that I'm going to talk about in the next video blog. I'm not talking about the band wall now, but about the local responses to the dredging, because the thing is that quite soon after dredging started, people began to complain about the deteriorating quality of the water. Recreational fishermen, professional fishermen, and people who lived near the harbour and used the harbour a lot were talking about its contamination, about increased turbidity, that is to say cloudiness, but also about the possibility of uh, uh, environmental toxins being sort of stirred up because of the dredging. Now how could this be? Well this has been an industrial city for many years and uh, natural spillage from industry, the kind of thing that is unavoidable, plus uh, many people suspect illegal um, basically illegal dumping of toxic waste into the harbour had been going on for quite some while. Possibly. At least there were environmental poisons in the uh, mud that was being dredged up. So this is being dredged up and some of these uh, environmental toxins find their way into the water and eventually possibly into the digestive systems of mud crabs, fish and other marine life. So fishermen were reporting lesions, you know, sores, okay, uh, on, on, on fish. They were reporting dead turtles, sick fish and uh, shell disease on the mud crabs much more widespread shell disease than one, one, what one used to have. Shell disease is known, but it had been, become extremely widespread. So you had reports of that kind. To cut the long story short, uh, after a while, uh, fishing in the harbour was banned for a few weeks by the authorities, suspecting that it might be environmentally uh, dangerous, dangerous to eat the fish. 
Many fishermen, most fishermen in fact, went out of business. Some of the people who had seafood shops went out of business. Lots of people stopped eating the fish or the mud crabs from Gladstone Harbour. And some people still don't eat fish or mud crabs from Gladstone Harbour. So in other words, um, this had immediate um, effects on the uh, fisheries. But the causes of diseased fish and mud crab disease, etc., are disputed and still are disputed. The fishermen hired uh, a biologist, Matt Landos, to prepare a report which concluded in no uncertain terms that there was a high incidence of certain environmental toxins, certain heavy metals and other things in the water which would uh, contribute to uh, making the fish sick and which would probably make it risky to eat the fish. Whereas others, uh, um, other people's research uh, and other people's views, um, notably the City Council, the Ports Corporation, um, and other representatives of the establishment argued that, no, as a matter of fact, the cause of the increased turbidity and the high incidence of certain diseases, particularly in the Baramandi species of fish, had to do with flooding. The Awonga Dam near uh, Gladstone flooded over during the floods of 2011, leading to a number of Baramandi to be sort of washed over the, uh, uh, washed over the rim of the dam and uh, into the sea, um, leading them possibly to become uh, ill as a result, okay, and, and creating those sores and so on. As I speak, in 2014, two years after the completion of the dredging, there is still uh, no agreement about the cause of the uh, fish disease and the mud crab uh, disease. There are researchers who have studied the seawater who argue that um, the seawater is fine, you know, that everything is within the acceptable limits, as I say. There are other researchers who have also studied the seawaters and have looked at, to some extent, the same data or other data, but looking for other things who reach the exact opposite conclusion. conclusion. And then there is the knowledge based on experience. I mean, uh, there's a lady I know who takes her dogs for a walk in this beautiful Spinnaker Park every morning and she said that, you know, one day she discovered the presence of a fairly large number of large dead fish on the beach. She'd never seen that before and she wondered if that could have something to do with the dredging. Or there are people who live across the straits here on Curtis Island who have started to record the incidents of dead turtles on the, who have been washed up on the beach. And again, there are quite a few. So there is a feeling in a certain part of the population that something is not right, that at least uh, one should allow the benefit of doubt to prevail. Whereas uh, authorities up to now have been adamant that um, one should say uh, assured that the dredging has been uh, carried out in the most responsible way, that uh, continuous seawater monitoring is being carried out and that uh, if there had been any risk at all, the public would immediately be informed. There can be no doubt that they are acting in good faith, but there can also be no doubt that there are competing stories, competing uses of expert knowledge and competing uses of knowledge based on experience, which sometimes lies in the face of the kind of knowledge projected by the authorities. So this is yet another story about competing knowledge regimes which are brought to bear in very different ways on the particular situation associated with change.